Hello and welcome to Emerald Financial Small Caps Watch. I'm Bronte Moore and today I'm joined by Gary Phillips, CEO of Farm Access. Gary, thanks for joining us. Hi Bronte, thank you very much for having me. Gary, we've seen news recently across a few different Farm Access divisions. Can you tell us a little bit about Farm Access and your primary research? So yes, Farm Access is, um, might be a bit unusual for, for some investors when they look at it for the first time and that we're, we actually have two parts to our business. So uh, we have a history where we've actually developed a drug in cystic fibrosis and we've taken it through to market and we've got it approved by the FDA in the US, in Europe, uh, Russia and Australia as well. So that business actually generates cash and is cash flow positive, so it's putting money into the business. The other part of our business, which is, um, I think, probably the, the key thing for people looking at Farm Access as an investment is the new drug development. So we have uh, two drugs which are in phase two trials, which will deliver both efficacy and safety results by the end of next year. And I think that's where the blue sky is in Farm Access and probably where the greatest value appreciation is likely to be uh, going forward. Gary, looking deeper into your cancer treatment research, can you give us a progress update on the current trials and what you hope the data they bring will mean for Farm Access? The pipeline that we have uh, at Farm Access is uh, a set of small molecule drugs. Um, they are um, inhibitors of enzymes which are involved in both inflammation and fibrosis. And uh, the, the lead drug we have at the moment, which is called 5505, it is in a study for a rare kind of bone cancer called myelofibrosis. Now, in this disease, patients uh, have a life expectancy of around about five years. Um, the current treatments they're on really don't do anything for um, sort of extension of their, their lives. Um, it, they really treat the symptoms of the disease, and mainly reducing the size of their spleen and other symptoms like night sweats and, and bone pain. So. In myelofibrosis, the, the, the key biology that's driving disease is a fibrosis or scarring of the bone marrow. And the bone marrow is the body's uh, factory for producing red cells, white cells, and platelets. So our drug is aiming to stop that fibrosis and scarring of the bone marrow. Uh, and by doing that, you restore the function of the bone marrow. Um, and it can then um, start producing those red cells and white cells and plates again. So hopefully it will be disease modifying not just treating the symptoms of the disease. So it's a it potentially breakthrough treatment in the disease. We are in the first part of a two-stage study. Uh, the first part is what we call a dose escalation study. So this whole study was approved by the FDA, um, the US authorities under um, an IND. So they've already reviewed a, a large package of information on the drug. Uh, and the first stage is what we call dose escalation. So we're trialing three different doses in, in, in three steps. Uh, each step, the patients stay on the drug for a month. Uh, and we look for um, two things. One is safety. So are we seeing any side effects of the drug? And the other one is how much are we inhibiting um, the target enzyme, which in this case is lysoloxidase, in the patient's blood. So we can tell the level of efficacy we're getting with each stage. Uh, we're already through the first dose uh, and we're more than halfway through the second dose of the three. Um, so um, we've already released some results saying that, you know, we believe that even from the first first dose we went in with, we saw good safety, uh, no side effects to really write home about. And we've inhibited the enzymes by, um, you know, 50 to 70%. So we're, we're very happy with the level we've reached and we're pretty confident now in one of the next two doses, we will reach a level of efficacy which fully blocks those lysoloxidase enzymes. Uh, once that's done, then we take the, the highest dose, which is efficacious and safe, and we put it into 24 patients for a period of six months. Um, and then we measure the real efficacy end endpoint. So we're looking at that point, obviously safety over the six months of treatment, but also looking to see what happens to their uh, red cells, white cells, platelets, uh, what happens to the level of uh, fibrosis in their bone marrow. We'll, we'll be taking bone marrow uh, biopsies of them. Um, and that study should report uh, by the end of next year. So that's really gonna drive news flow and value, we think, for the next 18 months. And uh, we're really excited to be already partway through the first stage of that study. We've seen Pharmax as mentioned by a few high profile researchers over the past few months. Can you tell us about the other applications they're looking into and what it could mean for you? 
you know, we uh, the the drug development group at Pharmaxis has been uh, really successful um, in a, in a couple of different ways. So, one is that we've produced um, five different drugs to different targets over the last uh, four or five years uh, that have got through the preclinical testing and into the clinic. And because of that, we've attracted the attention of some of the scientific and clinical opinion leaders globally, who have looked at the targets that we're going after, the disease targets, the enzymes that we're seeking to inhibit with our drugs. Uh, and they normally already have a, a, a hypothesis that you know blocking these enzymes will lead to a change in the disease and a potential treatment for the disease. So when they see that we've got a drug which inhibits them, they're very keen to work with us uh, and they pick up our compounds under agreements with us and put them into their own models of disease to see whether um, they will be successful. Um, and some of these collaborations that we have have been published, and some of them are going to be published over the next six months. So, um, and the ones that have been published, really, there's a recent one from Professor Carol Pollock um, in Sydney, uh, the Colling Institute. So her team uh, have put both uh, two of our drugs, a, a lysoloxidase 2 inhibitor, so a drug that specifically inhibits lysoloxidase 2, and 5505, which is the one that blocks all of the lysoloxidase enzymes, uh, and put that into a, a model of kidney fibrosis. Um, and this one, um, the uh, the animals involved had their fibrosis induced by uh, a drug called cyclosporin, which is also potent is also used very regularly for the treatment of rejection in stopping rejection in patients with kidney transplants. So from this, um, uh, Professor Pollock and her team really believe that um, uh, our drugs have a, a real potential place in the treatment of kidney fibrosis going forward. Um, and um, we were talking to them about uh, potential studies that they could do, including one that, that possibly looks at stopping the rejection of kidneys uh, after transplant in patients that we receive them. So that's, that's really exciting. Uh, the other collaborations we've got, I haven't um, published their data yet, but we've been very pleased with the progress they've, they've made. Um, one was with the Garvin Institute in uh, pancreatic cancer, another one with the team in Rochester, uh, New York, which is looking at liver cancer, um, and another one with a group in Germany looking at myelodysplastic syndrome, another form of leukemia um, that's quite rare. Um, and in, in all of these cases, our drug works in combination with the existing standard of care. So if you take uh, drugs like PD-1 inhibitors or gemcitabine, which are the main chemotherapy used in treating diseases like this, cancers like this, um, they very often don't produce the effect that they, we'd like to see because they have difficulty penetrating the tumor itself. Um, but this is because the tumors have become quite fibrotic or stromal, we call them. So um, because the, the drug can't get access to the tumor, um, it, it really doesn't produce the effect that we'd like to see. So um, if you give them in combination with our drug um, and, and use it to break down the stromal or fibrotic nature of the tumor, then potentially the, the existing chemotherapy can work a lot better than it does already. So we're expecting preclinical data from all of those um, groups to come out in the second half of the year, I think, which will be really exciting for people to see the additional uses that we could put 555 into. Uh, and then we can look at potential clinical trial applications going forward. So it's a, yeah, it's a, uh, really exciting to work with these the best brains in the world on on, on these diseases. And 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 we're really um, you know pleased with the attention that we've got and the interest that they're showing in our in our science. Gary, as we know, drug development is a very competitive industry. What sets Pharmaxis apart from other players in the space? Um, well, in Australia, uh, if we start with that kind of um, span, then um, we're one of the few companies that have a, an active drug discovery group uh, that have biologists and chemists working together in labs, uh, doing the basic science that's required to produce uh, new drugs. Um, that group is led by um, two very experienced team members um, from that have come from uh, large pharma companies before, one of them from GSK and the other one from Bury Ingelheim. Uh, and they, those, those guys are, are really um, drug developers. So they've turned what we had, have had for quite a while in Pharmaxis was an excellent science scientific program. And they've really turned it into an excellent drug development program. And there, there is a difference. And so they understand what it takes to get uh, a, a drug through to the clinic uh, quickly. 
um, and you know they're you know that that team of as I said at the outset have, have put uh, five drugs in the last five or six years through into the clinic which is an outstanding hit rate and one that many of the big pharma companies would be very happy with certainly with the size of team and the and the in, uh, very limited investments we've actually made in this group so you know that that really is a, a very successful group and has produced a number of different drugs uh, which potentially can benefit Pharmax's shareholders going forward. I mean, you, you can't really produce the improvements in, in valuation until you have drugs in the clinic. Uh, and, and our team have been very successful. And a lot of those drugs have all come at one time. So, you know, we've had two drugs that are in the clinic at the moment. The one, 5505, which we've talked about uh, in myelofibrosis. The other one, 6302, is uh, we're working with uh, Professor Fiona Wood in Perth, um, and she's got that drug in uh, in phase one studies at the moment, so in healthy volunteers on the skin. It's a topical drug which will be used to reduce, uh, hopefully re reduce scarring. Um, so we hope to put that into the clinic uh, in patients in the second half of this year, in patients either with burns um, or with established scars. Um, and looking to, in Fiona Wood's terms, she's, she's hoping that we can we can melt the scar away um, by stopping the, the excessive scar formation, which causes both cosmetic and functional problems for these patients. So, what sets us out? Yeah, two drugs out of uh, the, the the pipeline already in the clinic and really going to produce data by the end of next year. Um, the bronchitol business, the cystic fibrosis business, uh, is creating cash. It's already on the market. That's adding to the cash in Pharmaxis and helps fund some of those clinical studies. Um, and, and with that, you're seeing a company which has got a fairly broad pipeline. So one of the problems I think in investing in biotech is that um, very often it, it, you know, it's all, all or nothing. Um, we, we, we work in a fairly high risk area. We produce drugs and uh, not many of them get through into the clinic. Um, so an investment in Pharmaxis is, is not just a binary investment. You're not waiting just on one program to either go bang or bust. Um, we've got a number of different irons in the fire and uh, with a lot of really good preclinical data that suggests that we will be successful in the clinic and, um, and, you know, and the money in the bank to actually get there as well. So it, it's uh, an investment in Pharmaxis perhaps doesn't carry some of the, um, as I said, sort of the binary risk that investments in other biotechs uh, has. So I think we, we do stand out. We are quite different than, than quite a lot of the other um, biotechs in the, in the, certainly in the Australian market at the moment. Gary, it sounds like there's plenty of progress being made across your clinical trials and pharmaceuticals business. So we look forward to hearing more about your breakthroughs and external research soon. Thanks, Bronte. It's been really good talking to you today.